Welcome on to the Final Furlong Podcast. I'm Emmett Kennedy, joined by French racing expert and race planner Adam Mills. We're going to take you through our best bets for day four of Cheltenham 2024, the final day after the British roared back. Panic? No panic. There's no crisis in British racing. It's all perfectly fine. A like and subscribe on YouTube is much appreciated. 90% of our viewers, Adam, are not subscribers. Hit the subscribe button. Join the Final Furlong Podcast Gravy Train. It's all for free. Uh, betting for the Triumph Hurdle minus Sergino is headed by Majbara as we try and figure out which one of the best Willie Mullins horses on the Gallops is going to win the Triumph Hurdle. Majbara, 7-2. Stormheart, choice of Paul Townend. He can't choose Majbara, obviously, but he can choose the others. And he's gone for uh, Stormheart, favorite for the Spring Juvenile last time out, 9-2 uh, to two after being second there. Big gamble on Joseph O'Brien's horse. They won the Boodles earlier in the week. Can they win the Triumph Hurdle as well? 5-1 to one is the general price for Nuremberg Ring. And Cargis, who Adam put up on the show, he put us in clover with Sergino. In clover with Cargis, and yet she is the fourth favorite, having beaten most of these Mullins horses last time out. What do you make of the Triumph Hurdle, and who's your pick? Oh, it's a really difficult race to, to get excited about now without Sergino. It is, it is kind of, this is the ultimate game of Willie Mullins bingo featuring Joseph O'Brien. But what I do think with the two gambles, when the markets came out and then when the markets were initially adjusted when Sir Gino came out, they were right. The wise guy horses were too big. Bunting was as big as 20 to 1 when this market was reformed. Well, that's ridiculous given he wasn't that far behind them at, at Leopardstown. And Nürburgring is kind of, the one who's been put up on a variety of different tipping shows and podcasts that are out there. And if you take the Christmas form literally, when he when the horse was carrying a penalty, then he deserves to be about the same price as Carguess. My argument would be that Carguess also wasn't suited by the way that race panned out. And the fact there's seven pounds between them would probably mean that I I I, I am not going to have another bet in this race because I've played played around with it so much. And you know, I said on this podcast that. After the DRF, I sort of laid everything off, took all my money out and covered it. But if I was coming to this fresh, I think I'd still back Carguess. I just, I watched that spring juvenile back. She's got Majbra's number. There's five or six of them jump in the last, or jump in the second last, sorry, which would be a little bit kind of unusual for a spring juvenile. It makes me think the form is perhaps subject to question, but we don't necessarily have a challenger to it. And and she just she quickens past Madbury like he, he's not there. She makes a mess of the last. If she jumped the last, she probably won by four lengths. I think she will uphold the form with Stormheart. Madbury could improve definitely. Would I back him as favourite? Probably not. I just think Madbury is the longer term chasing type, and even on heavy ground, this, this might go against him. Salvatore Mundi's guesswork been off the track for eleven months. His form with Sergino is very good. The pre wild monarch form is excellent, but. How do you know? And and if Salvatore Mundi was really going all over them at home, surely Paul Townend would take a chance rather than ride a horse that he knows has already been beaten. I don't know. It's it's wide open. The, the one who I thought might drift to an each way price is Salva for Gary Moore. He's done a little wrong. I don't think he's quick enough. I think he's going to find at least one of the Irish just too quick for him. But if it really pours a rain and on that first race, it was proper heavy ground i'd give him an outside squeak but i'll, I'll stick with car guess until she's beaten i think that seven pound an ounce could be could be worth its weight in gold we know danny mullins gets on well with her and ultimately she was the fastest horse in that race from the second last to the line at the drf so the others have got to catch up with her rather than the other way around your logic is perfectly sound um danny was on the runner-up in this race last year and maybe she's just been completely underestimated and We'll go and do it. I think one of the things I'd say is it's a 19 pounds improvement from bunting from first run to second run. It's a 10 pounds. That's on Racing Post ratings. It's a 10 pound RPR improvement for car guests from first run for Willie Mullins to second. Um, it's a reasonable improvement for Stormheart, 132 to 139, not massive. But what does that mean for Majbra then? Because the official BHA handicapper has given Stormheart 140, Majbura 139, Bunting 138, and Carguess 136 because of the weight allowance she's getting. But how much improvement can we then expect from JP's horse? Because if if they're going to improve that much from their first run, then he should be improving as well. And they've already said they're going to ride him differently. The 
problem is, Adam, the price is gone. Yeah. The, the, the problem is the price is long gone. And if you think about when we first recorded the French juvenile show back at the end of January, Madra was 25s. And the fact that they've chosen to come here is not a surprise because he'd won a race in France and there was no novice status to protect. They may as well have pressed on. I, I don't know. On the form he's shown on the track, does Majbra deserve to be favoured for the triumph? No. If I was on at 25s, you'd be in Clover. You'd be thinking, happy days, I'll lay this off and we'll let him run. And I can definitely see a case where Majbra wins and where he proves to be the best juvenile. It wouldn't be beyond him. Stormheart is the one I think, I think we know what Stormheart is. He had five runs on the flat before he joined Willie. So after seven starts, how much more improvement is this horse going to find? Not so sure. Nürburgring has got the form, probably the forgotten horse, but again, the price has gone on that. And then you're kind of into the sort of the, the, the realms of guesswork. Would I back Madgebra? No. Would I lay it? No. I, I think in 12 months' time, Madgebra will be the best horse from this race, either as a novice chaser or as a five-year-old who's gone hurdling. But right now, I just wonder if this might happen a bit quick for him. That's what it looked like to me in the DRF. He travelled nicely, jumped the second last, and then suddenly the speed, the taps were turned on and car guests came past him on the bridle. So as much as Madgebra is open to more improvement than she is, he's got to give her seven pounds again. It's not a certainty. I'm, I'm talking myself into backing car guests again, which I really shouldn't because I've got anti-post that's, that's covered that. But I don't know. She's the only filly with a chance. And I, I just don't know. That seven pound allowance we saw last year, the two fillies were, were miles better. We're, oh, no, it's, it's such a mess of a race because I was all prepared, really thinking that Sergino was going to waltz this. And I think oh, yeah. if Sergino was fit and ready, he'd be a shade of odds on. So I can't really form a strong enough opinion for you, Emmett. I think if you wanted, to, if you forced me to have a bet, I'd back Car Guess each way because I don't think there's three geldings that are able to give her seven pound and at around 11 to two she's a fairly safe approach in your expert opinion as somebody who studies french racing every single day which of the two horses that i'm going to mention has the greater scope for improvement on friday bunting or stormheart bunting stormheart which of the two do you think will be which of the two do you think will be better suited to two mile one on the new course at cheltenham on soft ground just bunting just i just think bunting. bunting has i think bunting is faster stormheart i've watched back all of his flat runs he eventually won a flat maiden at mont de marsan on bottomless ground so we know he landed the ground but he's a grinder and i think we saw at the drf whilst he traveled nice and he stayed on for second he, he wasn't going to beat Carges. and actually if she doesn't fluff the last she's got his number I would I would imagine Stormheart will run well, but if there's any kind of the, the point in my head really is I think they'll get to the second last and then this is going to turn into a real speed test between those final two flights. And I think Stormheart will be outpaced. And then he might stay on, but I can't imagine Stormheart is going to be able to live with the pace of the others. Bunting might, he's open to any amount of improvement. And we know he handles heavy ground. He's ten to he's ten to one when he probably shouldn't be. I, I would have Stormheart and Bunting probably around the same price. Bunting could improve any amount. He's only had a couple of starts, as could Madgebra. I mean, Salvatore Mundy could improve. Who knows? But that's far too much guesswork for me to want to form a strong opinion. By it's, the time this podcast comes out, the, it's going to be a, a fairly quick turnaround, and you'll notice we're doing things a little bit differently on this episode. Um, Adam's very busy. I really appreciate his time. I'm up the walls with talk sports so we're doing this for youtube we're getting that out as quickly as we possibly can um and it's the second time we've recorded actually because the audio was a disaster on the first one uh massive apologies to darren pierce who did some great work for us on a fox hunters preview audio was absolutely atrocious you couldn't possibly release it and uh, the same thing happened again with a george gorman uh, episode so adam is here with his expert view um if you listen back to the show I, it was the first time you were on i was asking you about bunting uh, you might not have time to go and watch 
Here's Race Back. I'm talking to you, you, the viewer now. Thank you very much for joining us. Hit the like button if you haven't already on YouTube. Um, but the first time Adam was on the show, I was all about bunting for the Triumph Portal. I loved that debut at Limerick. And if you have time to watch it, uh, find a replay of it on the Racing TV website. I thought it was magic. Really, really impressed with him. And I stuck with him for the Spring Juvenile on the back of that and didn't take Adam's advice like I should have when he was telling us all Cargis is the one to be with. But Martin Dixon just tweeted out a video of it absolutely lashing down with rain in Cheltenham. And you watch, I know the way you're thinking. Shout out Katie Young. Shout out Gavin Lynch on the Final Furlong podcast. You have us in clover with that one. Thank you so much. But he is sailing through the mud at the end of that. But this is going to be really tough conditions. Stormheart will stay. Bunting will stay. And I'll take the bigger price about bunting. There's nothing, there's only a pound between them, according to the official, two pounds between them from the official. BHA handicapper, but on RPR is only one pound between them. And on time form, I think it's very similar as well. Um, time form go 161 Carges, 158p uh, Stormheart, 156p. Sean O'Keefe has ridden two Cheltenham Festival winners for William Mullins as well. So he's actually the jockey who fares best aside from Paul Tennant when it comes to Cheltenham. So I'm I'm going to go with Bunting, Carges for Adam Mills. Let's move on to the uh, Bet MGM. County hurdle. Everybody able to withdraw their winnings? Okay, everything everything going all right. Hey, we're looking for a new betting sponsor. We're not having a go at anyone at all. Uh, Lodasod is the four to one favorite for the the good guys. One for the good guys. One time for the skeletons. Deary me, they are absolutely tearing it up. What a day on Thursday. Uh, four to one. King of Kingsfield five to one. Uh, and Ab- absurd. Uh, who was put up by Aidan O'Hara, who also put up. Mon Morale on the final Furlong podcast, a massive price winner of the Pertomps. And when he put up Absurd, he was a 12 to 1 shot. That is long, long gone. Who do you like, Adam Mills, in the county hurdle? Well, where do we start, really? You, you, can't, you cannot possibly ignore the claims of Lodison. You absolutely have to take that into account. And whilst I am vocally not Dan Skelton's biggest fan, the more I think about it, the more I think actually. It's not Dan Skelton I'm against. It's the handicap system and the way it's managed. You shouldn't hate the player. You should hate the game. And all Dan Agreed. Skelton is doing is playing the game better than everybody else. Lodasud, that- I think the bit for hurdle was the day. But having said that, they've turned the horse around. I I, I much prefer Lodasud to Favoir. I think if you look at Favoir's record, I'm, I'm not entirely sure he's the horse who's going to back up five days later. So I, I Lotus Hood would certainly be of interest to me. Do I want to keep stuck in at four to one in a county hurdle when he's he's not technically a novice and there's others there's others that you sort of think might have a bit more in hand. King of Kingsfield's form, my goodness, if it's just on form alone, look at that form, Ballyburn and Slade Steel. You, you can't ignore that either. Absurd, I can definitely see the cases for him. Paul Town and Booked makes it interesting. The, the one I like. Is drifting like a barge, which is always a bit of a worrying sign, but it is a Willie Mullins novice called Westport Cove. At the time of recording, he's out to 28 to 1, but we got Mustard Mikey O'Sullivan on board. This horse chased home Key de Bourbon in the Munster Hurdle at Clonmel on heavy ground. And I've been watching Westport Cove all season because I've thought, here is a horse that they don't think is quite grade one, but that they think they can get well handicapped. He's not really been put in races. Got very close to Key de Bourbon at Clonmel on the ground. Fourth last time. The form behind Tully Hill doesn't look as good, but he wasn't put in that race, really. He's out to 28 to 1, which would suggest perhaps they think the other stable hopes have got more of a chance. But I do think he'll run a big race. There's six places out there. He would still be my each way pick in the race. And obviously, if he runs well, it's just a, a massive plus to the favourite for the Martin Pipe later on, which we'll come to. But I'm going to allow myself two darts, and I think I am going to. I have to back Loda Sud. I think the Skeltons have just had it right off this week. Their horses are absolutely flying. They've got the handicap plots right in the main. Yeah, it will be a win-only play, but you'd kick yourself if Dan Skelton's already cleaned up in a couple of handicaps and you don't back the third one. It, it, it almost seems too obvious. Uh, he's, he's winning with too many horses. It's like, can he really go and do it again? Uh, but I, I completely see it. I absolutely see it. Um, uh, and you have to give him maximum respect. Uh, I like one at 40 to 1 in this. 
and I'm coming around to the idea that I really like him. So I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about Akon Risk for Chris Gordon. Um, he's dropped significantly in the weights, but crucially, won the Betfair hurdle of 138. He's down to 137. Um, he has raced three times in the break of after a break of 60 days or more. He's won twice. Goes well on left-handed undulating tracks. He's run at Cheltenham four times. He hasn't won, but he has placed. And crucially, he's won on soft ground, showing a very high RPR in the process. And you're getting 40 to 1 about a horse that the British handicapper has dropped significantly. And isn't it just a bizarre coincidence that some of these horses were all done favours, these handicappers that have been winning the all-aged handicaps? It's nice, that. Mon Morale dropped in the weights. Unexpected Party dropped in the weights. Ah, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, we did get one back with the Irish with um, I know the way you're thinking who just Derek O'Connor really took the piss out of the handicapper there but what do you make of uh, Arkan Risk for Chris Gordon and Rex Dingle he wouldn't be for me he wouldn't be for, I mean Chris Gordon had a double at Plumpton on Monday which he always does the Monday before Cheltenham I must make a note to remember that and not just kick myself every year but he does I, I just I, I'm not sure I'd want to back a forward going horse in this race as much as today you Fair. needed to be on the pace the more it rains the heavier it gets huge field you're going to have to use a lot of energy to keep yourself in front of a 22 run a county hurdle would he go up the hill I'm not so sure i'd never put you off because he's 40 to 1 and you know if you put someone off 40 to 1 it wins i won't be accepting any liability for it but uh, i'd be a little bit worried about him going forwards I just think the the problem with this race really is there are six or seven who you think have got quite a bit in hand. Certainly six or seven mm. who at Christmas time, their connections decided they were coming here rather than grade one targets or novice targets. That would, that, that would, that would be enough to think that a more, the more exposed types are going to struggle. They do win this. They do win this. You should never be put off. We've had, Top weights win this and all sorts. But I think in heavy ground, you're going to need to have something in hand because it's going to be a slog. I think Orkin Risk, even coming back down the weights, he hadn't quite shown me enough to be on my radar. But it is, it is, it's not like it's an obvious, there's no state man in here. There's no future champion hurdle winner. I don't think you have to worry about that. But I think what you do have to worry about is there are several horses high 130s, low 140s, who may well be 150 horses. And that Orkin risk isn't one of those. Yeah, true. Um, I'm not sure he needs to be. He's got a... He actually comes out top on Racing Post ratings. He's got 169. So, I look, I can't let him go on back. I would take all of your concerns, though, on board and would echo them. But 40 to 1 is massive compensation. I, I do find it difficult to get away from King of Kingsfield. And I feel like this is... Kind of a bad selection when he's five to one in a county hurdle and he's not state man. He absolutely is not state man. But mark of 140 probably is fair enough. And you're getting to back the not only Ballyburn form line, but the Slate Steel form line as well. And I I can't really let that go. Um Gordon Ellis hasn't won this race, but he was a very unlucky second in this race last year and probably should have won. Um, uh, on another day, me if Jack Kennedy had been fit, I think they would have won it. So, two against the field, Arkan Risk and um, and King of Kingsfield. King of Kingsfield would be the bigger play. To the fascinating renewal of the Albert Bartlett. I know, I know, I know. I have to give it the proper name. It's official title: the Potato Race. Uh, reading Tommy wrong. Jeez, the vibes are good, but two to one, seven to four. Oof. Uh, Gidley Park is a five to one shot. Dancing City eights. Captain Teague. 17 to 2 and Lecky Watson. You can set your watch by him. Uh, 11 to 1 and 9 to 1 in between the two prices. Who's floating your boat in the potato race, Adam? Well, I, I, I must have missed something here because when we did when we recorded another show like 24 hours ago, reading Tommy Wrong was nowhere near a 2 to 1 fav. I, I, I've got to take him on at the prices. I think that lawless it's and madness. nice form can be questioned. Il Atlantique is a pretty suspect horse in a finish, shall we say? Ah, he's soft. For, he's a soft. Yeah, yeah, he's a little bit. He's a little bit of a softy. Um, Firefox was in that race. Dropped back to the Supreme. Clearly, wasn't suited. This 
there's plenty of holes in this form at twos. I, I can't be having them at twos. It's good to see a few firms going out the old four places here, which makes it interesting for me. I think Dancing City is the more interesting of those at the head of the market. Get Gidley Park, whilst I have huge admiration for Harry Fry, and he's obviously won this before. You know what I mean, Harry. A, a British novice in a grade one hurdle at Cheltenham. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure his form is anywhere near as strong as the Irish. He's certainly not been in races as deep as the Irish have. I thought Dancing City in the Nathaniel Lacey was really impressive. I think Dancing City will run a big race. My my main fancy for this race would have been Nicky Henderson, Shanna Bob, but he's not here. So we'll, we'll, we'll give Joe Donnelly's other one a shout. But then at, at a big price, I do want to have a chance on Ben Pauling's The Jukebox Man. Now, I've got to be honest and think, at the start of the week, I'm kicking myself because he was as big as 50s and he's now into 22 to 1. I know we've had a few non-runners and things come out that would have affected us slightly. But the more it rains, the more I'm interested in the jukebox man. He's won two races at Foss Lass on heavy. And if you've ever been to Foss Lass on heavy, that, that is the deepest ground known to man. It is absolutely bottomless there. He carried a penalty to win a novice there in December. He was third in the cello, two lengths behind Captain Teague. I thought that Chalo hurdle was a very difficult and attritional race, but he just kept hanging around for pressure. I've got this nagging feeling that the jukebox man is just tough as old boots and will end up as a Welsh national horse one day. Is it likely that there's an Irish horse or two with more class than him? Definitely. But will the jukebox man stay all day and run through brick walls for Keelan Woods? Probably. So therefore, I, I think I've got to let him have a little little poke on him. If he's 20s or bigger, he's worth a little each way. But I just think at the price, his Dancing City would be my main fancy. I think you're right about Dancing City, and I'm surprised Paul's not writing him. And I just wonder if this reading Tommy wrong, he must be. I, I, I know that there's a stat somewhere in my uh, from Cheltenham last year about Willie Mullins with authorised progeny at Cheltenham, and he has like a, a ridiculous record two to one in a three mile grade one novice hurdle that's going to be run on proper soft ground with the rain still falling and the track being sliced to pieces they'll have run the triumph hurdle they'll have run the run the county hurdle as well by the time this comes along nah absolutely not and uh thanks to paul ferguson's excellent weatherby's Cheltenham festival betting guide only three of the last 16 winners had yet to race beyond two mile seven Step forward, reading Tommy Wrong, who hasn't done it yet. I want a horse who's got experience of the trip. I want a horse that I know is going to stay, and then I'm not questioning whether they're going to or not. Um, that would bring in Lecky Watson. I just wonder a little bit about him. Like that's the Slade Steel form line as well, by the way. Maybe, maybe he is the obvious one, but why did Paul not choose him then? Um I think Dancing City is rock solid. Rock solid. The Predators' goal form line worries me a little bit. I was surprised he ran as bad as he did in the Bering Bingham. I thought he was clear second best for Willie. Shout out to Buddha Magan and his friends, by the way, who had the forecast on Ballyburn with Jimmy Desoy. And Jimmy Desoy goes off 66s. Deary me. What a bet. That's stunning. But the horse that I'm coming down with, I'm basically following in Katie. Katie last week put up Search for Glory or two weeks ago. Um, and she had a glint in her eye when she was saying it. And since she said that, I've heard this horse is working unbelievably well for Gordon Ellis. Now, Gordon has fired a number of bullets at this race over the years. He's gone close. He hasn't won it. He's had 12 horses running it. None of them have won. It's going to happen for him eventually. And his horses this week, like Tihupu, Jeff's kiss there from Jack Kennedy. Absolutely superb. But Firefox, Irish Point, found a 50. Romeo Coolio, like they're hitting. They're brighter days ahead. Jesus, she should have won. But they're going real close. And this fella will be staying and staying and staying. You, All he does is stay. And he's a seven-year-old. So he's battle-hardened. He's more physically mature. He has a lot of, of um, attributes on his side for a potato race on soft that could be heavy ground. I was talking to a friend of mine who was walking the course this morning, Thursday morning. He was amazed Banbridge was running. It's like this is not this ground is atrocious and it's rain. It's done nothing but rain since. Search for glory is a twenty-eight to one shot, uh, and I will take him. I'll split it with Dancing City, who I'm very interested in as well. Um, the big one, the Gold Cup of the Boodles 
Cheltenham Gold Cup, where Gallop on the Champ is available at 11 to 10. Why? Even money is the general price, but one firm is going 11 to 10. We'll give him a shout out. It's William Hill, seeing as they sponsor Talk Sport 2. Uh, Faster Slow, out to 6 to 1. All right. Jerry Kalam has come in from 10s to 8s. Lom Press, a 10 to 1 shot. Carrick Rambler, the wise guy horse, is a 14 to 1 shot. Adam, who will be lifting Racing's Blue Ribbon in the 100th renewal of the Gold Cup? Well, I, I think Gallup in the Champ is at even money. I think that's the right price. I think that's the right price because he's been there and done it. He ha- Anything that ran in the race last year, he holds them. He holds that form. And if he holds Brave Man's game, you'd have to think that he probably holds Gentleman's game. He already holds Jerry Kalom. He's miles better than Lom Press. Monkfish is too old. You know, if you wanted to get second in favour, you could do. He's not my kind of price, even money. I just think on heavy ground, you get unusual results. It's it's not something I'd be massively keen to lump in on. The more it rains, the more I'd be turned off a of fast or slow. I just think, and we know he's had a wind off as well, but I, ju- I just think if this turns into an absolute slog, fast or slow, might just come up a little bit short. His wins have been at Punchestown, and he's used a little bit of a turn of foot. I just don't see that. But the way I'm going to approach this race is I've got to take Gallup and Deschamps out of the equation because ultimately I think there's only one horse in this field who's a 180 chaser, and that's Gallup and Deschamps. The rest are not quite that good. So I'll go into the betting without market. I'll take Gallup and Deschamps out, and I'll just approach this from the point of view that this is a three-mile, two-furlong staying chase on heavy ground. Some will stay, some won't. Some have got the class, some haven't. The, the two that appealed to me most at the prices would be Jungle Boogie, Definitely. He's got legs made of biscuits and they can never quite keep him sound for long enough. But he's had two starts this season. He won the album photo race at Tremor. Soft ground will be his bag. Staying will be his bag. They've decided to come here rather than run him in the Ultima. In the betting without market, he's 20s, which I just think is a bit of an insult to the boy. He's actually a very talented horse. It's just he's never quite got there long enough. You can back him to win the race outright at 40s under Rachel Blackmore. I think he'll get quite a quiet ride. I can't imagine they're going to want to put a fragile horse up in the vanguard. He's a big price. Correct Rambler is worth a bet because I just think the Correct Rambler, this is what he needs. This is going to feel like a four-mile Grand National. Ignore his form before the, the turn of the year. He always comes alive in the spring. My worry for Correct Rambler would be that he's if he runs – a big race here. He's probably going to leave any hope he had of retaining the national behind. But I just think a keen, a horse like him where he's got his own ideas about the game, the best possible scenario is a race where he won't have time to think about it. And that's what this race is going to be. Real war of attrition at an endless gallop. It's going to suit him well. Those would be my two that I would probably play against the field. But I'll just take Gallup and the Shop out of the equation because I think ultimately, if Gallup and the Shop runs to his best, the others are just playing for second place. Do you reckon this is going to be a slug? I think it has to be. It just has to be because it's heavy ground. At, at best, this will be soft, heavy in places, even with the very um, creative wording used to describe the going this week. We can all accept that this is going to be soft, stroke, heavy. So if you watch today's Kim Muir, which I know is a different level, but in the Kim Muir, they didn't go that hard and they were still strung out like the washing. And I I must give a little shout out to my mum. I know she watches the show. Hello, mum. But my mum said to me today, I'm going to back Gitmaker in the Kim Muir. I like the name. Bless her. And as Gitmaker jumps the last, she said, what's this thing on the outside? I'm like, well, you know, you've bumped into a handicap block. But... What I would say is you look at that Kim Muir, you don't even see the third and fourth. They're strung out like the washing, having not gone that hard in a handicap. Something in this race will take them along. I just I can, I can see this being one of those gold cups where on the second circuit at every fence, one more horse checks out. And it will just be a case of survival of the fittest. And as they come down the hill, you probably won't have that many kind of in contention. So what I'd be looking for if I want to have an each-way bet, which I do, is I'd be looking for a horse who's not going to be ridden to win. I don't want a horse who's going to be upsides Galapanda Champ, giving it everything. I want a horse who's going to be ridden quietly with the view that they've still got some kind of a chance as they turn for home. You want a stayer. You don't want a horse that's up in the vanguard. But I just I can't see any way in this field 
that this isn't truly run. Because there's no, if, if it's a run like a two-mile four race, who's the fastest horse? Well, Gallop and Deschamps. If this race was the Ryanair, Gallop and Deschamps would be about one to 20 because he's got so much more gears than the rest of them. So someone, whoever it is, has got to try something different. They've got to draw the sting out of him. It's going to be an absolute war of attrition. And I want two horses who are ridden out the back with a view of trying to pick up as many pieces as possible. I almost think there's a problem for Gallop on Deschamps in this race with the way it's going to be run because you watch back the Gold Cup last year. I was, you're supposed to be watching every horse, of course. Um, everybody <laughs> who's a long term listener, long term listener to this show, and we're brand new to YouTube. We're only here a few months. So, uh, welcome to our YouTube channel. We don't normally, norm, normally we're not on video face for radio rating ideal, uh, but I'm glad there was no video on me for the Gold Cup last year because. I was screaming and roaring at the telly. Rupert and Lizzie were doing the commentary. I had to come on and do the analysis afterwards. And I was like, oh my God, Gallop on Deschamps is insert colorful language. It was just a nightmare at the start. Um, he hated the the experience. And then Paul goes, okay, this this holding up worked early on in your career, Gallop on, but it's not working now. We have to go forward. And in the end, he crushes them. It's a brilliant performance. He was held up in the John Drucker Memorial. He didn't like it. They've returned to front-running tactics in the Savills. They've done the same thing in the Irish Gold Cup, where basically Paul has con controlled things in a four-runner race against Faster Slow, who was probably coming in fresh and would have benefited from the run and probably wasn't fully right anyway, which is why he's had the wind up. But he can't do that here. You can't make the running in the Gold Cup in 2024 against the field that you're going up against. Look how many horses want to go make the lead. Uh, the real whacker wants to be up there. Monkfish they probably might not go forward on him, but they could. Brave Man's Game can be handy. Uh, Naslam will press. Lompress will be handy. So what does he do? Now, he can sit in behind those, but he can't make the running. And if he does... Jeez, I don't know how that would work. Um, Jack Kennedy doesn't have to worry about that. I almost hate myself for this. I am coming around to Jerry Clown. Oh, man. Um, Dennis O'Regan was on the show last year, and when I asked him to describe what Jerry Clown was, because he'd ridden him to victory, he described him as a future Welsh national horse. And when I said, hold on a second, this is the favorite for the Brown Advisors. Like, oh, well. Uh, uh, he's going to get his Welsh national ground. And... I know George George will be watching this. I know George is a massive fan of Naslam, and I know George, I know that he's working incredibly well in the Moor Yard. They weren't running him in this race, by the way. Naslam was going to the Grand National, and Gary Moore has put him in here. He'd announced publicly, he'd said to the media, no, we're not going to go, we're going to go straight to the Grand National. He's working so well, they're putting him in. And he'll get his ground. Um, I just wonder if it's a season too soon for him. Whereas Jerry Kalam is a grade one chaser. And they'll stay and stay and stay. I can't explain Leopard's Down to you. I don't know what happened there. But on a break of 60 days or more, he's three from three. And has run to his career highest RPR in the process. Um, handles heavy ground. Has one on soft. Shows his best form on soft. And he stays. He is HMS Jerry Kalam. He is Don Slowly 2.0. He is Ferry Kalam. He'll just keep on staying and staying and staying. And he'll get you the each way money. And he might get you the sweep if things go his way. So, reluctantly, I'm going Jerry Colum. Have I lost my mind? I'm, I'm going to ask you a serious question. I need you to give me a serious answer. A few years ago, did you back Santini to win a gold cup? God, no. No, I was not a Santini yeah. man. So why would you be a Jerry Colum man? I just think they're in the same mould. I, I did I back Don so Poli to win a Gold Cup and was convinced he would win it. I just, my, my concern would be with Jerry Colom. I just, I wonder if he'll be able to keep up. I just, I'm not, can, I'm trying so, I really like this horse. And last year I was all over him for the Brown Advisor. I couldn't really understand how he wasn't a very short price. And I just, I just don't, I think if this, if the real wacker gets loose on the front and this, they really tow them along. How much energy is Jerry Colomb going to have to expend 
just to keep up with the pace. What will he have left? I think Jack Kennedy has got to take the view, I'm on a dour stayer. I don't want to be anywhere near the front. And the danger with doing that, as we saw today, is that's only that only works if the leaders have all got their fractions wrong. And I think if you gave Paul Town in the ride again on Fasal Vega, he would certainly want to be involved in the early burn-up. I think if you look at just the way this race is likely to pan out, I just worry for the likes of Jerry Colom and, and perhaps to a little degree to Naslam as well. The gallop they go in a Welsh national is probably four or five kilometres an hour slower than the gallop they're going to go in a Gold Cup. So whilst these horses will stay, how much more energy are they going to have to use up to just keep up with the early pace? And let's face it, if you were riding the real whacker at 40 to 1, you're not going to drop him in. You're going to have to run him forwards. And that just tows the rest of them along. There's there's kind of, I would take the view that this is going to be one of those gold cups just where it's all about who can just keep themselves in contention and who's got the ability to still have something left. Jerry Colom has the ability to have something left, but does he have the speed to keep himself in contention? I'm not sure. Six, six starts over two miles, six plus. He's never been out of the first two. That's true. He'll stay. He will, but has he ever met a horse of the caliber of Gallop and Deschamps? Yeah, and he got blown to pieces by him. Oh, now, Brian Atchison, as I was transferring, because uh, I don't have racing TV in the studio, so I needed to transfer down when um, when we were continuing the coverage on TalkSport 2 today, and Lydia was interviewing Brian Atchison at that time, and she was saying uh, he couldn't have been right in the Savills. And he said he can't explain it, but something had happened. That he had, he said there was no physical injury, but he had hurt himself in some way. They're convinced he hurt himself somehow, and he just didn't perform. And I would view his beating of Envoy Allen, who then goes and runs a massive race in the Ryanair today, when he probably was just a little bit too fresh. Like Henry wanted to run him in the Savills, then they wanted to run him in the Horse and Jockey. He's ended up missing both races, and that's probably cost him the Ryanair. If he'd had one more run. If he'd run in the Savills, he'd have been beaten by Gallop on Deschamps, but that would have put him spot on because he was lapped in the King George and still went and won. Um, not taking anything away from Protector Out and Lizzie Kelly napped Protector Out, so shout out and well done. Thanks for watching the TalkSport preview, by the way. That was that was huge. Um, it was also a gold mine. There's so many winners. Apparently, Alan Brazil has taken us all to Barbados. Happy days. Um, but I, I'm going to take the view that he can't have been right there. He cannot have been right at Leopardstown. And he'll stay. If Gallop on Deschamps is the Gallop on Deschamps of last year, then he wins this. And I'd love to see him do it. But I backed Cotto Star at odds on in a Gold Cup against Denman. I backed Cotto Star at a short price in his fourth Gold Cup, bidding to win it for a third time. I'm not doing that again. If Cotto Star can't defend his crown, it's going to take one hell of a performance from a horse like Gallop on the Champ. And he is absolutely the best Gold Cup winner since Cotto. But in the 99-year history of the race, there's only been eight multiple winners. It's a grueler. And everything's got to go right for you to win it. So I, you put him in your multiples, for sure. I just I can't take the evens. And I love fast or slow. The Sant de Sants are winning. You two Sant de Sants flying up the Cheltenham Hill today. I just, I would have your concerns as well. Uh, like, I think he is... He's a better jumper than Gallop on Deschamps, and that's not an opinion. That's Paige Fuller's race IQ data specifically and categorically shows he is faster or slow is a better jumper than Gallop on Deschamps, and he gains ground at his fences. If he stays, he's right there, and the wind up could change things as well. He's one on heavy, and he's one on soft. Jesus, maybe he's just the play. Hmm. Martin Brazel, he's a decent horse, but this will be the biggest test of his career. I don't want any rain because of the better ground, the better his chance. I also think an honest true run race would help. Jerry Kalam, each way. Final selection for you, my man. I'm, I'm gonna I'm just I'm gonna go in my gut. I'm gonna back Jungle Boogie each way, four places, 40 to one. 
and bet, back him in the betting without market as well. He's going to get the ride I want, and he's going to outrun his odds massively. I love a big opinion, and particularly a big opinion on a horse at a big price. Good luck to you, sir. Um, fair play. Uh, Jerry Kalam, the cowardly each way bet in, in the race. Um, I really like Gentleman's Game, by the way. I think it's 11 years, or 2011 was the last time Mouse Morris trained a winner at Cheltenham. What a fantastic thing it would be if he could do it. He's He's got to be a very good horse. Um, third in a grade one over three miles to Classical Dream, who's basically unbeatable around Punchestown. Buried Ion Maximus on Chase debut, beaten by the winning most horse at Willie Mullins Yard in easy game. That's a factual fact. Uh, on heavy ground at Gorn Park, and then beats Brave Man's Game. Admittedly, he's race fit and he's getting weight, and Brave Man's Game makes a mistake. But the further he went, the better he was. And Brian Atchison was saying he was so well in himself that if he'd gone to Down Royal, he thinks he'd have beaten Jerry Colum that day. Do what you want with that information. Um, it's it's uh, Jerry Colum each way for me. I can't believe I've done a complete about turn there. What a turncoat I am. Lizzie Kelly's going to kick me out of the Gallop on the Sean Fan Club for sure now. The Hunter Chase. Uh, the market is headed by It's on the Line, now in the JP Silks. Derek O'Connor, could this be his last ride at Cheltenham? Possibly 6-4, to four. Ferns Lock, 130. If you heard the interview David Christie did with Lydia Hislop on Road to Cheltenham, you couldn't be anything but cheering on David Christie. What a class act. What an absolute gentleman. What a, what a lovely man and an incredibly talented trainer. I would love to see this horse win. I, I've had stamina concerns, Adam. Um, and I know that a number of people have had stamina concerns, but the more I look at him, the more those stamina concerns start to fade away. He did win a three mile two race. He has one on soft and he has one on heavy, but maybe soft ground on the new course at Cheltenham over the Gold Cup trip might be just a little bit too much for him. I, I think it will. I just think, I think Ferns Lock. The best race for him is the Aintree race. I think the two mile five and a bit round there is what will suit him better. Yes, he has won over this far, but he's won over this far at Turley's. And that, that is not the same stamina sapping test that three mile two on the new course of Cheltenham is. For, I mean, it's on the line is six to four. And I understand why six to four. Derek O'Connor, Emmett Mullins. It, it is an obvious choice for the progressive horse. And if you were to say, look at this race and think, right, what's the one horse who's probably better than Hunter's Chases? It's It would be it's on the line. Do I want to take six to four? Probably not. I think the solid, safe, each way bet is Premier Magic. Won the race last year. Done absolutely nothing wrong since. Stays forever. Bradley Gibbs knows how to ride him. He'll handle the ground. He'll handle the trip. He'll run a nice race. Is he likely to run a better race than last year? Probably not, but I think he's going to run the exact same race he ran last year. That should really be good enough to hit the frame. I mean, if you look down this field, I, I mean, the first one, as, as much as I am in love with Sam Crow and always will be, th this is not Sammy's day, unfortunately. And heavy ground three mile two does not no appeal chance. to me at all. Bill no Away chance. is... I mean, Bill Away feels like he's been around forever, but as much you know, that was very eye catching the way he ran on last time. But I just I don't know is is there that much juice left in his legs? I'm not so sure. And then you're into horses that really have no business being here and that either won't stay or may not get that far. Sine nomine is kind of half interesting. Thought he ran all right at Weatherby when I watched back the replay. I've no real strong opinion on Hunter's chase form, so I couldn't give you an, an exact. He might have the brain, but. I kind of I don't really get involved in Hunter Chases. I'd rather listen to Darren Pierce and a few others. So I will just stick with kind of the basic approach that I think Premier Magic will be in the first three. I can't see a way that he doesn't finish in the three if he gets round. And at six to one, that would probably do. There's a chance Fern's Lock is drifting to too big a price here. Like the the talk about him from David Christie's yard is unbelievable. And he is a genius. I, I would love for Barry O'Neill to get a winner at Cheltenham. I really love it for David Christie. There's a chance he's going to too big a price. If he keeps drifting out this way, that, that might get tempting. Um, when we recorded with Darren Pierce and then the bloody audio fell to pieces, um, he was all over it's on the line. And to be fair, at the time, 
they were kind of locked together at about five to two each of two and now it's six to four it's on the line i can't imagine he's going to be six to four in the morning so hopefully if you're watching this he's drifted back out again some bookmakers trying to be a little bit generous but um jp's having a good week um i can't imagine that six to four on the hunter chase is appealing to jp's punting prowess but getting his juices flowing but um yeah it could be very interesting all right mares chase uh, Dino Blue, will she stay? She would have won the champion chase. Not taking anything away from Captain Guinness, but oof. if there was no Maris chase, she'd be the champion chase winner, in my humble opinion. Maybe Captain Guinness would have won. Um, but considering what she did to gentlemen to me, you'd have to think she would have gone close. Well, will she get her Cheltenham win here? Uh, five to four is the best price you can get about her. Limerick Lace has been all the rage on this ground. Seven to two. And Allegory Devassi last year's second, nine to two. Adams, who is going to win the Maris chase? Oh, no, the, the more it rains, the more muddy the waters get. I, I will, feel, firstly, before we go, know who's going to win. You and I recorded a show the other day where unfortunately the audio didn't work. I'm furious because when we recorded that, Pink Legend was 80s. The horse is now 40s. Pink Legend is definitely worth a very small each way bet in this race. She's not good enough. She hasn't been good enough in the past. She's not good enough again. But she will handle the ground. She's got a fantastic record at Cheltenham. She's got a fantastic record this time of year. Venetia has had several horses run really big races at massive prices this week. I can't let her go on back. Anything 40s or 50s, she's worth a tiny each way because she does just come alive for this race. I'm a little bit concerned that maybe she's not quite the horse she once was. But, you know, it, it's not that long ago that she was winning a listed chase at Newbury. And she just, I just can't, I can't let her go. I think she's better than a lot of these. Whether she finds one too good, as she always said, is probably highly likely. But that's a big price. The more she drifts, the more I'd be interested in going each way there. As for Dino Blue, I think if it's heavy ground, she's got to be opposed. She's just got to be opposed because this is going to be asking her to go further and harder than she's probably gone before. She's not really bred to be a dower stayer. There's no chance of Dino Blue running over three miles. Two mile four in the mud will probably stretch her enough. Limerick Lace is becoming, I think Limerick Lace should be a lot closer to Dino Blue in the market than she is because she will stay. The Doncaster race fell apart. Even the Clonmel race that she won probably fell apart a little bit, but she, she stays forever. She handles the ground. She'd be of interest to me. Allegri de Vassi, I'm not convinced she wants two and a half miles. And on heavy ground, I'd be even less convinced. And then you're into sort of Brides Hill, Riviera de Tell, Marsh, Wren. They're all going to run nice races, but they probably don't have that class. Right now, I'm going to stick with Limerick Lace with the tiny saver on Pink Legend, just because I think Pink Legend will run a massive race and will at least outrun her odds. I think I've worked out what happened to Allegory de Vassi last year. It was the Tiapu factor. It was a year too soon. Three six-year-olds have won in this race, and three six-year-olds have been beaten. She's seven. She's more mature. She's strengthened up physically and mentally. She was deadly on heavy ground against Riviera to tell the last day. And I know that was over two miles, and I know there are some people who think that that's her real trip, but that doesn't make any sense because she's won over two mile six and she's won over two mile four and her best RPR is over two mile four. She'll win this. She'll get a Paul Townend special on the new course. Unlike the Jade de Grugy ride. She'll get a Paul Townend special on Gold Cup Day on the new course and she'll win the Mare's Chase. She'll outstay Dino Blue and she'll win. Um, to the lucky last, the Martin Pipe. I'd say they were fairly convinced that Waterford Whispers wasn't going to get into this race, and yet the theme of Cheltenham has been connections whose horses were not going to get in, being surprised that they all got in. And Maybe that tells another story of Cheltenham 2024, but Waterford Whispers has been all the rage in the JP Silks. Uh, Mike, Mike O'Connor on board, 7-2, to two, joint favourite, best price with Keita Bourbon, who is the Gavin Lynch special. He told you about, I know the way you're thinking, and he's telling you about Key to Bourbon as well, and he did that on the final front of the podcast. But who does Adam Mills think is going to win the Martin Pipe? I I think the market has got this spot on, really. Do I want to back either Key to Bourbon or Waterford Whispers at seven to two? Probably not. I mean, Waterford Whispers, they thought, oh, she might not get in. They also might not get in. It's sailed in. It's number 13 in the handicap. What were they worried about? It's unreal. This is one of those 
Cheltenham races where everyone thinks there's loads of plots going on, and there are, but it's just progressive horses. Keita Bourbon has obviously got a favourites chance, and when you hear the likes of Ruby Walsh talk, they seem to think this is a grade one horse in disguise. Is he Don Poli, Gallop and a shot? Well, he might be. He might be, and you you know you could do worse things than take seven to two to find out. But I'm not I'm not sure that I'd really want to be getting involved at that kind of price. Same with Waterford Whispers. You know, fair enough. If they've got this horse in here and they've got a stone in hand, well played, that can win. Oh, I mean, I'm going to have to do it. I just I, I shouldn't back Nicky Anderson horses. I shouldn't, but no ordinary Joe is bloody obvious. How no, blatant. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. They've not been trying. I've got a. Uh, he's tens. He's tens. What's going on? It's bloody obvious. He's not been trying. He's Langer Dan in green and gold colours. Tiny, <laughs> tiny. He is. He is that. Look. I mean, I have watched back. I watched back his Kempton run, and I thought, my God, the stewards have got to haul him in here. What's going on? And it's just that. Uh, it's oh, a it's war Nicky. crime. Carry on, Nicky. It's Don't worry crime. about it. If your name was McNally, you'd have a 12 month ban. But as it's you, you carry on. Look, it's a Nicky Anderson. 12 year horse. ban, mate. McNally got 12 years yeah. for less, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, we have to be clear. It's a Nicky Anderson horse. You've got to go win only. It's got to be a small stake. They've left him in. That That's one thing that would sort of make me think, well, they've obviously scoped them all. They've obviously done some kind of, the vet's got to be happy. So they've left him in. I'd, I'd be so annoyed at myself having thought this could be a plot. The more it rains, the, the less I like O'Castle Demar. I'll wait for another day. So Keita Bourbon is the most obvious winner. I would probably look at if he got to five to one, I'd have to back him. I'd have to back him at five to one because there's there's five places around. You could go each way if he drifts, but whether he will or not, I'd be very surprised. And you'd imagine there's one or two Mullins multiples rolling up tomorrow. So that price probably won't come. I think Keita Bourbon is a better horse than Waterford Whispers. The handicapper tells you that. I think that. I think he'll uphold that form. But like I say, I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. And if I've been careful this week to make sure that I'm in a good position going into Friday, but I'll probably be giving something back. But I, I've got no, no ordinary Joe. It's got to be a bet. He's got to be a bet. If Nicky Anderson's horses were in form, he'd be fives and he's ten. So I'll roll the dice. I respect you rolling the dice. I, I do, but um, I think you're absolutely yeah i think you're a maniac to be back at anything of nicky's jeez man you're you're a braver man than i am and i'll tell you what if he goes and wins i'll i'll send a pint to you I, i'll just i don't know get a door dash delivery service to come around with a pint of guinness to you and go fair bloody play um multiple horses pulled up multiple horses lapped good luck son good luck no, uh, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Let me let, let's have a balanced argument. Lucia ran a huge race in the champion hurdle. Yeah. Bold, in, yeah. bold endeavor in the attempts. Where did that improvement come from? I'd given up on that horse when I was at the bottom of the cliff with him six starts ago, and he ran like an absolute superstar. It, it's not impossible. And there is a very good chance, bearing in mind that Nicky doesn't have anything else with a chance running on the day. But this horse could be like 16s, 18s, 20s. And he's a bloody obvious JP McManus plot. Now, clearly, the J.P. McManus team didn't imagine that Nicky Anderson's yard was going to be riddled with whatever the problem is. But if they leave him in, he's going to just keep drifting and drifting. And he's got to be worth a tiny stake. Because if the horse is right, we know that this has been the plan all season. I can tell you're not you like me after an He'll be, he'll be like me. No, he's look. He's blindingly obvious. He was second in the race last year. He'll be like me after an asthma attack. He'll be pulled up at the back of the field. Um, I'm really sorry for Nikki the way it went. I, I really am. Although I will say, Tony McCormick was telling me that Lydia Hislop did an interview with him on Tuesday and said, "How are all the horses, Nikki?" And he said, "Oh, they're fine. They're all fine." <sighs> Nikki Anderson doesn't help himself sometimes. He really doesn't. Anyway, we're not supposed to question Nikki. There's something weird in British media. You're just not supposed to question Nicky. And I do feel very sorry for him. Um, better days ahead. Hopefully there's better days ahead for all of us. But Danny Gilligan's been booked to write him. It's Gordon Elliott. Took on Slade Steel. He took on Asian Master over a trip that would not have suited him. Asian Masters run an absolute blinder in the Supreme. 
for young Costello. He gave him a fantastic spin, and he got a great tune out of him. He's a, a winner at Fairy House earlier in the season. Okay, and admittedly, he should be winning that race. He's a long odds-on favorite. Jeez, he fair. That was the sign-up to GavinLynchRacing.com. Novice Hurdle, by the way. Uh, that was over two miles seven. He fairly sluiced in. He'll stay no problem. Uh, Gordon, there's a statistic about Gordon horses dropping in trip at Cheltenham. Basically, they're to be avoided at all costs. So it's a good thing he ran him over two miles last time then because he's stepping up and he's got a good record with those. I think he's really interesting off a of mark of 140, particularly with Danny on board. And Gordon rarely misses in this race. Even Imagine ran a monstrous race in this last year. He'll be right there at the finish, I think. I think he's a he might be the scumbag each way better the day, actually. Better days ahead. In fact, I think he is. Um, Keita Bourbon and Waterford Whispers. Sure, look, we know they're probably grade one horses masqueraded in this. And Keita Bourbon really does look like a Sir de Champ, Don Poli 2.0 type. Gigginstown have got a great record in the race. Willie's got a great record in the race. I'm looking at you, Kilalta Vic, to go along with Sir de Champ, Don Poli, and of course, Galapon de Champ. If he's the grade one horse they think he is, then he's going to win. And I'd be much more interested in him than Waterford Whispers. I think. I think Waterford Whispers has become too much of a wise guy horse. Keita Bourbon was the one I'd be really afraid of, and I think he's the most likely winner. But I cannot let Better Days Ahead be... Can we get bigger than nines? 10 to 1. 10 to 1, Better Days Ahead. Better Days Ahead. To be better than Better Days Ahead in the final race at Cheltenham. All right, who is the nap of Cheltenham 2024? Uh, <laughs> it's a tough one, isn't it? It's not an easy. That is not an easy thing to to ask and to pick. Who is your best bet on on the final day? It's okay. a really tricky day. I, I won't give you a nap, but I'll give you a best bet, and I think the best bet is to back Car Guess each way in the Triumph. Okay. Okay. I'm not doing this now to be. I'm I'm going to do a multiple. I'm going to. And this is, I'm going to do this as well. Um, as soon as we're off the air, this is the Lucky 63 I'm doing. I'm doing bunting. You're getting 10 to 1 now. I'm going to wait until the morning. I think we'll get bigger than 10s. Because Sean O'Keefe has won twice at the Cheltenham Festival, but everyone's going to look at Danny. They're going to look at Paul. They're going to look at Mark. And they're going to forget about bunting. And it's a mistake. I think he'll be right there at the finish. Um, I'm going to skip the county hurdle. Although I do like... Actually, I completely forgot to mention Zenta, but you don't want to take too many bloody shots at that. Um, yeah, she's won on heavy ground and she's placed twice on soft. Like she was she was placed in the triumph hurdle last year. Is anybody even talking about her? Like, has, has anybody said, hey, you know what? Zenta could be interesting after an aborted chasing campaign and put over hurdles the last day. Uh, at a track she's gone well at before for a trainer who does exceptionally well in this race. I'd be probably more interested in Zenta than King of Kingsfield, just about, but uh, she'll be a single. Um, so Bunting. Search for Glory. Jerry Kalam. Allegory Devassi. Better days ahead. That's a lucky 31, isn't it? There's the each way lucky 31. I will see you in Dubai. Adam Mills, thank you so, so much for doing this again. I really appreciate your time on the podcast and thank you for re-recording with us. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Final Furlan Podcast. If you did, uh, like and subscribe on YouTube is much appreciated. Really helps us with the algorithm and just shows us that you're on the Final Furlan Podcast gravy train and on the bandwagon with us. We've got some things badly wrong. Fact to file for the Turners bolting up in the Brown Advisory still hurts to be completely honest about it. But Corbett's Cross at a double-figure price for the National Chase put up by George Gorman and Tiapu being a banker of the entire meeting when Kate when Kate tried to talk me out of it, knowing that horse as well as she does. Uh, thankfully, we kept the faith, and hopefully you did too. Uh, if you like the show, a like is much appreciated on YouTube. Enjoy the final day of Cheltenham 2024. There's been a lot of issues, but it's still the best four days racing of the entire year. And I hope you enjoy it from Adam Mills and myself. Look after yourself and each other. God bless.